Crusher. You listen to Art is King Podcast. and I work with Explore Gwinnett. I'm the Marketing Communications Director. Um, so in addition to handling all of the print collateral, all of the advertising, um, lots of different things, and even something new we're doing um, this October, it's called Arttober. Um, the website is arttobergwinnett.org. And basically, um, for the four weeks of October, we're promoting all things art-related that are happening in Gwinnett. And it's our goal to promote one arts-related activity every day for the entire month just to really show people that there is a lot of art happening here in Gwinnett. A lot of people don't realize that or you know don't notice it, so we're gonna hit them over the head with it. So um, please look out for that. Um, but as Anita said, um, social media is one of the big things that I do. Um, I've been on Facebook since probably 2005 when I was in college. Um, and for Explore Gwinnett, we're on Facebook, of course, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, we're kind of on Snapchat. Question mark. <laughs> and um, we're um, we try to just stay abreast of all the current trends and things like that. I go to a lot of conferences and things related to social media and marketing. Um, so Anita kind of gave me a little quick bullet list of just some different buzzwords and things that are kind of related to um, social media. Um, and you guys just kind of chime in. I guess this is really kind of a conversation and kind of laid back. So just kind of chime in with any questions that you might have or anything that you maybe don't understand. Or I would love to hear what, um, if anything, that you guys are doing on social media to promote your artwork. Can we start with that? Is there anyone who's using social media? What platforms are you guys on? Instagram. Instagram, Instagram and Facebook. Anybody? I use Facebook, but I have a question. Is it really important to me? I don't really care. <laughs> um, it's funny because um, one of the most recent conferences that I went to, it was in Philadelphia, and there was a whole session that was called Twitter is Not Dead. Because all these people have kind of abandoned, not, not tons of people, but um, people kind of view Twitter as like the abandoned platform, and Snapchat has already grown much faster than Twitter, and there's more daily users on Snapchat than there are on Twitter. Um, but our speaker was very pro-Twitter, and he told us lots of interesting facts and things about why you should be there. Um, and you can, you, uh, sorry, good. Oh, go ahead. You can link, what I do is, um, I use Twitter, and I link it to my Facebook, so anytime I tweet, um, it'll go to my Facebook too, mm -hmm. so that helps. You can definitely do that. It's just if you're going to do that, make sure you still um, go regularly and check on your Twitter because if people send you direct messages or tag you or anything like that, if you just kind of set it and forget it, then you'll never know that those people are trying to interact with you over there if you just never check it. But oh, okay. go ahead. Well, the reason I was asking that because I have a, a, a LinkedIn account. very, very different audiences. Um, and anybody else, please chime in too. Um, LinkedIn, like you said, is way more professional. It's more like your resume kind of site. Like, if I took a picture of this audience today and I was like, oh, I'm so excited to be speaking at NGAA, I would post that on my LinkedIn. I wouldn't really share that on my Facebook or anything like that. Um, so it's really, really um, more of a professional site and not really as social, in my opinion. Um, Twitter is um, definitely a younger audience. Um, people who want really, really fast information. Um, you can post something on Facebook and you probably, like say if it's really, really important or exciting news, you post it on Facebook. If you really, really wanted to get that out there again, you would probably need to wait like at least a week or so before you would share that same info again. But on Twitter, you can share it, like within two days, you can share it three different times. Just, you know, post it different ways. Um, a quick little tip that they taught us in that session that I was mentioning earlier is they said um, whenever you share um, something on Twitter, you need to share everything on Twitter three times. You need to share it one time as um, a question, like, did you know that NGAA is hosting a social media workshop next month? Then you need to share it as um, just stating a fact. NGAA is 
hosting a social media workshop next month. And then the last one was share it as a fact again, but just with different wording. Um, because on Twitter, everything is so instantaneous and it's gone in two minutes. It's gone. Most people don't go to your profile and read all your tweets. They just look at your timeline. I mean, they look at their timeline. So um, Twitter is much, much faster paced kind of thing. Are they using Snapchats for younger people at all? I mean, for businesses at all? Um, a lot of people do use Snapchat for their business. Um, Snapchat is, for, my, for me, really hard to understand um, or, or hard to get a hold of and really kind of grasp it. Um, the, the different thing about Snapchat is that you don't see um, like your number of followers and things like that. So for me and my business and working for Explore Gwinnett, we're really driven by the numbers and how many people are sharing this and seeing it and that sort of thing. And Snapchat is not there yet with the analytics. I'm sure they will get there. Um, but at this time, like we have a Snapchat account, but we're not snapping on the regular. Um, and now Instagram just added Instagram stories, which basically everybody says just kind of stole exactly what Snapchat does. Um, it's much easier to use though for me. I don't know what you guys think. And there's, um, we have a lot more followers and um, in engagement on Instagram anyway, but now when you go to your Instagram, at the top they'll have those little stories. You can do quick videos. Those are great for behind the scenes. If you want to kind of show people your process, or maybe if you're doing photography, if you want to show them where you're shooting that day and that sort of thing, um, those stories are great for that. They're only there for 24 hours. So be as goofy and silly as you want, and it won't be there forever. So. But it's nice, um, because, like, if, if, let's say someone like you're following, And if you're not in the mood to look at the videos, you can just still go through your regular feed if you want. Yeah. Um, so I like it a lot. I don't know if you guys, have you guys used that at all on Instagram? I know a couple of you said you have Instagram. Have you tried the stories yet? No? Has anybody actually sold any artwork using Facebook? I know I have, but, you know, or uh, Facebook or Instagram or any social media. So it is possible. Um, I, I reached out for a, an article from Instagram from someone on in Instagram. Oh, good. So that, yeah, it, it, it was kind of right when I started, too, so it was interesting. I haven't found it, no one else has found me that way uh, since, but but yeah, it was whole, uh, they asked me to do an, an article, and you know, I didn't get to sell my art, but it was a, it definitely helped. I think the thing for me with all of these platforms is who is your customer? Who is buying your work? At what price point are you? Snapchat, my customers are not on Snapchat. They're not yet. They right. may be right. yeah. because as their kids get older, or you know, and so my market is at, is at a certain income level, and so they, where are they? And mine are on Instagram right now. That's so. That's it's, it's going to be a fluid thing, I think. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, uh, I totally agree with that. Yeah, but you got to think about where is your customer, and that's where you want to put your stuff. You know, otherwise. Why, why spend your time? It takes a lot of time. So it why spend your time doing it? And I think, like, I just. Oh. Um, I have a question. I've not put any other tasks on yet. How do you go back and start? There you go. That's a good one. You pay her. <laughs> you mean, like, literally, how do you set up the accounts or how do you try to attract followers? Well, in other words, I've already got, I mean, I've got an account on Facebook. Should you use a separate account for your business? definitely want to set up a separate page, a business account with Facebook, so it would be a business page, not like it's a person. Um, there's lots of reasons to do that. Um, if you, Some people kind of make the mistake and they've kind of already gone down the road and they're too far along where they set it up as a person and name the person the name of their business, and then it gets all kind of messy because when they want to switch it, you have to then ask all those people who became your friends, can you now go over and like my page? Um, think about it on Facebook. People who are random, who you don't know at all, you don't really want to be their friend. But if there's a page of some artist that you heard about, you would definitely like their page because you want to see what 
you know, is going on with them in your timeline. But if you had to become their friend to see their stuff, you might not do it. Because then you're like, I mean, that, that person's not really my friend. So it's better to set up a business account. As far as what you should start out sharing, um, you can definitely start with some pictures of your artwork and things like that. But one of the best things about social media is it is the best place to really tell your story and show your personality. So you really want to show people your process. Show them what your studio looks like. Um, you know, what you're doing in the studio that day or what's your inspiration at the moment. Those types of things really help people connect to you beyond just seeing the end result, your artwork. I think this is a good time for Dan to step in because <laughs> Dan can help you even more because she asked about what can I do as me as an artist. And that's, Dan does a lot of connecting businesses with artists and even more stuff that I don't even know about. Well, I think um, what's being said here is, is exactly what, how you need to look at it. Uh, Victoria's right about all the different uh, social medias that are out there. But um, what Lisa said is, uh, makes sense is that you first you have to figure out who is the person who's going to buy your work. And once you identify that kind of people who buy your work, then that's how you find ways to target and uh, send out your message to them so that they are the ones looking for you. So let's pretend for a second that uh, you like painting boats and drawing boats. Well then you, your audience is gonna be boat people. It's people who buy boats and have boats in the marina and spend money on boats. And, uh, and so you're gonna go to boat shows and hand out your card and say, hey, I'm a boat artist and I like painting boats. And so that's what you do on social media. If you were to use Twitter, you may post a picture of one of your boat paintings as, and then uh, hashtag, there's a little pound sign that you use, and then a word after the pound sign, and then call it a hashtag. So you'll use the word hash, the, the hashtag symbol, and then say a word like uh, maybe the brand of the boat that you're posting the picture of. And those people on Twitter who are boat aficionados will pay attention to that hashtag, follow, see your post on Twitter, follow the link to who you are, and then get to know that, oh my God, I didn't know she painted boats. I need her to paint my boat. And so then that's how you find your audience. So these social medias are about finding who is the buyer, who, uh, connecting with the people who buy your work and telling your story. And the more you tell your story, the more they want to know you, and then they finally throw money at you. Good <laughs> <laughs> ma'am. Is that your dance? What if it's not, so, I mean, I don't do boats. What if it's not so cut and dry? I mean, I do an acoustic assemblage, so it's abstract. And mm -hmm. and well, every piece that you create yeah. may be different. Explain that piece. Yeah. And there will be words within your explanation and description of that piece that will resonate with somebody. But always check the interior designers. Right, there you go. <laughs> That's correct. Right. Always, especially, in, especially if you're going to a certain market. For instance, I'll be in Texas for three weeks. I'm hitting that market right now. There, I've already got a whole list. They're seeing everything I'm bringing out there. So before I get there, my goal is to be able to buy stuff and bring it back instead of bringing my own stuff back. And so, that kind of thing you want to you want to hit who it is you're trying to because they're your gatekeeper for a lot of clients especially for abstract and, and soft and caustic. So Yeah, you don't want to go there. Um, the, the other thing, I don't know if you've seen this, when 
find artists that you think are successful and follow them and look at their hashtag and steal them. Yeah. I mean, right. like if you, if you're not stealing them. Use their hashtags if it fits your work, if it fits your customer yeah. and fits your work. Follow you don't followers. have to create yeah. this. People are already doing it. Go find those people and see what they're doing and lift the things that work for you. While you're watching TV in prime time, sometimes they'll have a hashtag at the corner of the television screen. And that lets you know that people on Twitter right now are using that hashtag to talk about that show. Yeah. And uh, the companies, they use those hashtags to promote themselves and their companies and their products based if, if it fits the theme of what the show is about and the people who are watching it. So Twitter is a tool. And one thing to keep in mind is that right now you already pay for the internet access, you already pay for a smartphone, the application is free. The app, the Twitter app is free. To be online is free. But to use it is already free. So all you're doing is investing your time to build your business. <clears throat> Do it. It doesn't cost you nothing already. You're already paying for it. What you need to um, I have a question. How much do you use YouTube in your promotion and your business? All the time. See, I'm a special case because I am, a, I am an extrovert. So I love talking about myself. <laughs> he's the king. Can't you say he's got, he's got it Art is king, not myself. So he's, yeah. Art is king, right? We, we almost had to have a separate chair for him. <laughs> <laughs> so, so because I like to talk about myself and share my work a lot, I use everything that's out there. Anything that comes out, I'm, I'm paying attention to the social media and seeing what comes out. I was on MySpace a million years ago, and I was on Facebook when it came out. And so what I try to do is tailor my content and things that I do so YouTube is a perfect vehicle for telling the story further. So you can write a paragraph on Facebook, you can write 140 characters on Twitter, but on YouTube you can spend 10 minutes talking about yourself in that particular piece. And she mentioned uh, show your work, show your desk, show your brushes. Talk about the paintbrush you like. You never oh, know. Like that. Talk about, like that's that. great, right? <laughs> Talk about the paper you like to draw on and paint. And, uh, and, and if it's cancer, mention cancer five times, and maybe they start paying attention to you. And then throw you a palette of paper. You never know. You, so yes, I use it. I use all, everything that's out there. It's not a hashtag. So with Twitter, do you, in your title, put a lot more and will pull up people? Yeah, and YouTube, yeah, in the description. In the description and even the title, you may use a few words, yeah. But I use my phone um, to record. Mm -hmm. Yes, I use my phone to record all the time. At, there's a smartphone right there recording today. Right. You, the, 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 your smartphone is a computer. It has so much power that you need to put it to work. It's a computer and a camera. A camera, a phone, a computer, internet access, everything. There's a, there's a cheaper free website that you can use to take photos and turn them into videos. It's called Animoto. A friend of mine told me about it a long time ago. An, Animoto, like animal, Animoto. And it's it's a really good place to start. They have templates, and you can add music, and it just can make whatever you're doing more interesting. And like I said, you can start out free, and then just it's it's not very expensive at all, and it makes you look a little more professional. So, but he you have a lot of different resources, don't you, Daniel? Well, yeah. That you can offer. I, you guys probably don't know about him. He's in downtown Atlanta. Yeah. So, thank you. <laughs> I don't want to take over. I know you have a question. But, go ahead. but before we even get into that, I think one thing we have to understand first is that, yes, there's a lot of social media out there, yes, there's a lot of resources out there, but first you have to start with what is it that you want? What kind of artist do you want to be, and how are you going to funnel, what are you going to do with the people who come through the door? So we may open this store, we may have a place, and so on, and so you work on your presentation, you work on the decor, all those things before you even open the door to start telling people about it. So you have to look at yourself the same way. What are you going to do with the website or your portfolio online? To, once you bring people in, what are you going to do with them there? So are you going to have? You need to have a website where you have your artwork, where it's ready for sale, where it's easy for a person to have a transaction. You have to have a process where you already know that when something sells, you already you know stick it in a box, package it really nice and neat, and ship it out. So those are the, the business part of yourself and the the kind of presentation you want to think about that once you have that in place, that's what you use to promote in all the different ways out that are available out there. You have to know your story and know who you are and what you want. 
So then you start telling the world. And so then the social media becomes real easy to do. Okay, sorry. What about a situation where you're working from home? Should you try to set up with somebody in a business or someplace outside of your home? Because you don't want just anybody coming into your home, but, especially if you're by yourself. Well, if you set up a website, then nobody come into your house. <laughs> That's correct, right. And then if you've all heard of Amazon, somebody's never heard of Amazon? Amazon does the fulfillment most of the time, but there are also sellers who sell stuff on Amazon. You can sell artwork on Amazon. And that's it. You set up, you don't even have to have your own website. You just put in some products, some good, clean pictures of your work. Set it up there, tell it the price, and then somebody might buy. It. And they never have to walk through your house. Yes, you've had a question. Instagram and Twitter, do I have to go uh, right behind the space? So, 
All right, so the answer that I have for you is the answer that I really want to share with everybody. And that's why you're here today, coming out to places like this, right? It builds community. You get to know who's in your market, who is also an artist, and who is out here leading the charge into more information and sharing of resources. And so what, what your son, your son, your son, right? Your son, what he has to do is find those other digital artists. And in Atlanta, we have a couple of meetups. One of them is called the comic book and animation yeah. meetup. They meet once a month. Comic book and animation meetup. If you go to artistking.org, I have a listing. I have a list of uh, running events that happen once a month. Artistking.org. And so what happens there is that these artists who are in the animation field and are out there making cartoons and stuff, getting paid for it, they hang out once a month for hang, just to hang out because they all know each other. They all went to school. Uh, my friend here, his name is Wayman Humphrey. He went to SCAD and he's a, a graduate of an animation field. And so uh, in 3D modeling and the same stuff that you're talking about. Yeah. And so when they get together, they hang out and talk and then that's when they share information. So knowing where those groups are to come out and listen to what they have to say and, and, and communicate and connect. And so there's also another group called the uh, GGDA, Georgia, Georgia Gaming, Gaming Developers Association. That's right. And they meet once a month at different locations throughout Atlanta, and they always choose a um, gaming company uh, headquarters as a meeting group, a meeting place. So if you wanted to walk into a gaming company and show your work, then the, and that's the perfect time to go. Because there's a whole, they're opening the doors to anybody. So that's what you want to do. You want to find a community and build on it. And today, I, I, my suggestion would be not to everybody run off and just create a Twitter and an Instagram, but maybe find and connect with similar artists and say, let's do an Instagram together. Let's do a Twitter together. It, the NG, the NG, NGAA, NGAA yeah. could have the, the Twitter. I'm just throwing ideas because it's a brainstorm, all right? I'm not saying you give somebody a job. <laughs> for free, but 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 have an NGAA Twitter and Instagram, and say every other day we're going to feature a different artist. And if you are all members, those who are members, will say, "Cool, I get I get a feature once a month." However many members you are, right. sixty members, they every that's two months worth of content, and and the, and you assign a different person to run it every other week or so, and that way not everybody has to be an expert on this stuff. You know, we, I don't, I don't think we live here in this part of town, you do, nearby. Uh, we're in Decatur, where are you, Melody? Bucket. Bucket, so, so I, I don't want to make the trip out here to, to help lead that charge, but somebody in here in this community could do that. It's digital, I can do it for now. I'm an extrovert, I want to come to your house. I want to hang out with you. And, uh, and so then that's another way of doing that process so that you can get more and more familiar with that. I do that for my clients. I have clients who are artists and also businesses and brands, and I build their social media. And like she's doing for her company, but I do that as a freelance and as, a, and as an agency. So, so we do that all the time and build out, and then and then hand it off to to the to the company once they already figured out what they need to do. So, so that's so, an idea. So, and guys, let's, let's hear from Lisa too because she's she's worked really hard at this. What, do you remember what? Uh oh. <laughs> wakey, wakey. <laughs> Well, just, I'm just going to step it back from the social media platforms a little bit because I think it's easy to think that that's all you have to do. And because it, it's, once you get going, it's easy and it's also addictive and you'll spend five hours a day and you'll go, oh my God, I've got nothing done. But play right <laughs> so, <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Um, when I stepped into this, I was, uh, I'd been in the corporate world for 16 years as a um, internal coach and consultant for large healthcare systems not from a marketing standpoint, but from a process standpoint, which is what Dan's talking about, and putting your processes together to make your business function appropriately. And so that didn't really equate to this. I didn't realize how much it did equate until I actually got going with it. And so I started painting, got involved at the Atlanta Art Center. I found my community, which is what Dan's talking about. And I remember going in, I was terrified. You think I'll let me come play with them? You know, but, but they did because it was such a welcoming group, just like this group is, obviously. And you learn so much. I'm still uh, very close friends. Actually, we paint next to each other with Claire Blaylock, who's been in galleries for 40 years. She's been the president, I think, three times of the AAC. 
and things like that. And I learned so much from them about this business and what they do and who they are. And Clara is a very quiet, soft, introverted person. And then there's me. <laughs> and we're opposite. And so how she approaches her business is different from how I approach mine. And what worked for her, pieces worked for me, but pieces didn't work for me. So you're going to have to do that as you get to know all of these different people. And so as I went through, she was the key person when I was doing AAC. It's like an unpaid executive director's position. It was 40 hours a week running that group of 400 people. And, and you have a facility, and you have employees, and you're a volunteer, and all this kind of stuff. And we were trying to make it transition and do all this, and she came up to me in a very quiet way. <laughs> Talking about running a group where I might make twenty four thousand dollars a year, maybe. And I'm like, I'm gonna be a painter. <laughs> and that was the commitment uh, phase for me. But when you is everything from uh, or I, not product lines, but methodologies of getting your product out there. The galleries are one way and you're paying them, they work for you a 50% commission to sell your work for you. You do not work for them. That's key. And if you go in with the attitude, I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you so much. No, I don't need a contract. <laughs> then when you don't get paid, don't don't want it. So, because that's, they work for you. You're hiring them. Don't give them more than 50%, please. Don't ever give them more. Another avenue are the festivals, and there's different levels of festivals that you can do. And, of course, social media comes into all of this, pushing this out there. There's the high-end festivals that you can get into that are jury, where people are in there selling their work for $4,500 to $10,000 a pop. That's where I want to be, because that's the customer I want. But there's also the customer base where people don't spend more than $500 on a Saturday afternoon. That's okay, too. Which one do you want? Or do you have different products that can go to different ones? Do you do the print market over here for the 500 and down festival? Or do you want to go spend your day and you might make enough cash to keep going for another month? Or do you want to go over here in this high-end festival where you're going to travel around the country? It's going to cost you more, but you're going to make more. It's just going to be a, a bigger investment. Or you build that way up. You build your way up. You start with one and, and go your way. I am not. I learned early. I tried it. I, I am not good at that. I do two shows a year where I actually sit and sell my own work. And it's in a high-end design show. It's not in an art show. And that's all I'm doing in that market. I let the gallery sell, and I sell myself out of my studio and through social media. And so I've been doing this for 12 years full-time, 40 to 60 hours a week. I paint every day, five hours minimum. And Anita will tell you. That's, and so that's what I do. And that's what the people that I work with do. That's how much they work. And so, but this is all I do. And, and raise a kid. And now he's a teenager and he has nothing to do with me. So, um, Good job. So I'm working a lot. Good job. Um, so, with that, I think that's kind of where I'm coming from. It's, know who you are. Going back to what Dan says, know who you are. Know what you're I did not put all of my business processes in place. I'm playing catch up right now. I have a little corner for shipping out of my studio. And it fails every day. And But I will tell you an artist to follow, a couple of them to follow. Deanne Herbert, she's out of Nashville. She is the master of social media. And she's the master of, she does her original, like a 36, 36, she'll sell for $2,500. It's not a huge price point, And it's it's a big acrylic abstract. But she's got a following. It's kind of the Pottery Barn following. She's just launched in the Pottery Barn store in Nashville. Can you spell her name? Deanne Herbert, H-E-R-B-E-R-T. Deanne. Deanne. Deanne is her first name, Herbert. Um, Deanne Arts or something, you can Google her and find her. But follow her on Instagram and watch how she does her Instagram and look at those hashtags. You may not, she's not the kind of artist I am. Her clients are not my clients, but she is a master at that. The other artists I follow are Cynthia Packard, who is my teacher out of Provincetown, and Alex Konevsky out of Philadelphia Academy of Fine Art. Those are the two people that I've trained with. Alex, they are at uh, they're not in my market either. They're at the $25,000 mark up here. Wow. They're the big deal. They're in New York. They're at Art Basel. They're in Switzerland. They're everywhere. But I follow them just because that's the number one. They're the people that I want.
from a painting standpoint, I want to grow. But I'm not in that market. That's my, my group, we're around 8,000 and down. That's my target market. So I'm competing with luxury items. I'm competing when the economy goes bad, can we take our kids to Disney or can I buy this painting? Guess who wins? Disney. So what I want to do is get to the market where even if the economy goes south, those people still spend their money, and she knows them. They still going to spend their money. They might go to decorate a whole house to one room, right? But they're still going to buy original art, and they're still going to pay $4,500 to $6,500 for a painting. So who are you? Which market do you want? And you may build up to that market. You know, I didn't start at this point. Remember, you can always go up, you never go down in your price. No. Can, so, you, can, you make, uh, can you make some notes about um, how to price your art? A lot of us struggle with that. You know? And uh, we, we've talked about a dollar uh, an inch, a square inch, or two dollars a square inch. Or I'm, I am not a master at this. Um, I'm too low on my small pieces. My, my large pieces are just right for my market. I've got to raise my lower pieces. I, I'm not a master with price. I think you got to price it for what the market will pay. Um, and you don't really know until you test it. Mm -hmm. Okay. You don't price it for your own wallet. I'm sorry? You don't price it for your own wallet. It has nothing to do with you yet. Yeah, I mean, your price is not your value. It's not your favorite piece. But it's not, not like, you don't price it like, you, like oh, what you could afford. You know, oh, absolutely not. Oh, you know, that's a good point. You're thinking yeah. of your audience. Because, you know, a lot of people would be like, oh, I would never pay that for me. You know, well, but, yeah. I mean, my brother, my brother's a very successful businessman. I'm like, can you help me do my business? Because I don't understand what you sell. <laughs> <laughs> he, said, I, I would, he, he said, I wouldn't pay for something on my own. I'm like, that's because you get a free pay. <laughs> yeah. but, but, so you find the people who do understand what you sell, and that's these guys, right? Yeah. 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 Ask. That's I mean, right. you asked us. That's a good answer. Good, good yeah. way this is to find out. You have one connection. A lot of us don't have a clue what a designer or a decorator does. We don't even know one, a lot of us. So I'm looking forward to hear what you say. Okay. Okay. So I work for Wakefield Beasley & Associates. It's a rather large architecture firm um, over at Avalon. Um, we did Avalon. We designed Avalon. We designed Atlantic Station, um, the Forum Shopping, which is a little bit closer to y'all. Um, so we do everything from super large commercial to residential. Um, I've been doing interior design for 16 years. Um, I've got a construction background. I've been doing, I've done every single type of interior design project type outside of healthcare. I won't touch it at all. So <laughs> it's just not anything I have any desire to do. But um, there is a difference between designers and um, decorators. And um, the difference basically, and I'm going to try and say it as PC as possible, but um, basically a designer has to be licensed, they have to go to an accredited school, they have to get a degree, it has to be a four-year college. Um, you have to take a test to be licensed like an architect does. You learn everything from the inside out. So you're space planning, you're doing wall sections, you have to learn code, you're dealing with city officials, you know mechanical, electrical, plumbing systems, all of that on top of all the pretty stuff that you guys see. So the finishes and the artwork and the lighting and just everything on top of that. Decorators do what I call the fluff. And that is pillows and draperies and um, you don't have to have a degree. Anybody can do it. You can go get an associate's, associate's degree, I suppose. But literally anybody can do it out of their home. And um, so someone that has worked her tail off <laughs> to go to school for everything, you know, you definitely don't want to be called a decorator because you're like, oh, man, like, you don't know what a cope is. Like, you don't know how all that works. So that's really the difference. One similarity, though, we are both selecting artwork. In your case, that would be um, we, we're both doing that. So um, does that, like, decorators will have showrooms typically um, if they, so that they can sell art, they can sell furniture, they can sell accessories out of their showroom, and then they can, that's really their main way of make, making their money. Um, so that's one great place for you guys to get your artwork into is find out the great little um, showrooms that are in town, which a bunch
bunch of them are off Howell Mill, which is West Atlanta. And there's a whole strip of them. And I, in fact, use them because on my residential jobs, the other difference is just getting access to like furniture and different manufacturers and stuff that are to trade only. Um, we, I have a deal with a showroom down in the city, and so I will actually get them to price out what they would charge to like basically procure all the furniture for that residential project. So then I tie that fee into my fee, but then I'm also going to use her and be like, oh, they want this piece of art. Do you know any artists that, and I'm looking for this because I have the vision as well as my client. So I help them visualize what they need to be putting in their house. Unless there's someone that has a very good eye for art or something that they have a very strong personal preference. But sometimes you get clients, they have no idea what they want. And so just like I'm telling them how to pick paint colors and space clean their house, I'm going to tell them what art looks good. In fact, I just did the other day because they bought something that I was like, I don't know if I would have bought that, but okay. You know, and you have to kind of make it work. But, um, and they're buying them. There's a few different ways that we buy or look at art. Um, social media, I'm going to be honest, I follow tons of artists on Instagram. Um, I really couldn't care less about Facebook. I never, I don't really use it. Um, Instagram is my go-to. I do it as well to do just what you guys are doing to get followers, get clients, get people to come find me to get more projects, right? And in theory, you're selling yourself, right? So, and what's the kind of rule of thumb in selling? People buy from who they like. So they're gonna, you have to develop that relationship, like Dave all said all night, by, your, by telling that story of your art. My dad, he at 66 has decided to do sculptures. And out of the blue. <laughs> and he's brilliant at it. And what he does is he takes these, like he goes to auctions and buys old farm equipment and builds these metal sculpt like sculptures and stuff like that into this crazy abstract art. And he just went to his first show. We had no idea what kind of show it was. It was a early show. And we were like, cool, like all right, well, maybe that was just kind of love, like, no <laughs> idea. And he gets to this show last weekend, and he's like, um, I think I'm out of my league. <laughs> like, there are people there that this is, like, one or two of shows they do all year. And he killed it. And it was so cool because, and I've been able to help him with his social media, his website, exactly what he was saying. You have to set all of that up and get it in there. But I'm going to buy and look at stuff from Instagram, and then I'm going to go to ADAC, which is a place, um, you guys know ADAC. Um, and so they, you know, the mark, you go to talk, you know, shows at the mark all the time, right? For, they do, I mean, they can do for anything, but um, art, you know, you specifically go there for art, um, getting into some of the design shows that she was talking about. Um, and then also reps. So we have art reps that come to us and give us lunch and choose us so that we will buy art from them. And what's great about that, there's a specific lady and she, honestly, there's probably other people I could go to, but I go to her because I like her. And she's super easy to work with and I know that she's gonna do all the footwork for me. So because I don't have time to. I've got 20 projects, I don't have time to do that. I need someone to do it for me. So basically I go to Bobby and I say, hey, I need a piece of art or a print. Um, unless your commercial job has a huge lobby that you're doing that they can do some really big, awesome art, typically you're going to put prints in, you know, like in offices or an office space or healthcare. You know, it kind of depends on the client and the budget. Um, but I'm going to go to her and say, hey, this is what I'm looking for. And she's going to find it, and I'm going to say, yeah, that works, or maybe I want something with a few more blues in it, or maybe that's way too, I don't know, too abstract or something. I don't know. And she'll go find it. So, you know, getting into those art reps, and honestly, I don't know the best way to find those reps. You might be able to help them out with that. 
but um, I just know them just because they come to our office, and I could definitely probably somehow shoot off a bunch of them to like Anita, and then you could send them out or something sure. like that. But um, I can't just run it off for you at the moment. But that's another way that we honestly buy art all the time. And we'll sit there and look through books if we need to. They come and um, just show us what they have. And it's usually a full range from sculptures to paintings to pastels to whatever. Um, and then, let me see. Let me look at my notes and make sure I'm telling you. Yeah, that's basically it in word of mouth. Um, but I, I really do think local galleries, local showrooms that have decorators that go to them and, and even designers that go to them, um, and Instagram and art shows and things like that. Really more design shows though, but because um, I'll be honest, I don't go to festivals. I don't do crowds, I don't do festivals, I don't like to go. So I will not go to them. Um, and I'm probably sure that I'm not the only one, only designer that doesn't go to those. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just, we don't need to go spend our time on a Saturday in the heat in a bunch of crowds with sticky things and all that and <laughs> walk around. I mean, truly, you know, like, yeah, I don't need to be eating a turkey, like, you know, like, that's just not, that's just not, we don't need to because we have it right there for us you know, accessible to us. Um, but we do, we need art, we use it all the time, we use it in every single project. Um, and I would suggest going to both, like the art reps come to us and they go to showrooms um, for decorators as well. And the decorators are more specifically commercial, or I mean, residential. But, um, I don't, know. I don't know if I answered questions. Okay. You guys, any, any questions you want to ask? I want to build on one thing okay. that you said because this is just from an artist's point of view. I think it's really important to understand these people are looking for specific things for their clients. Right. So if they come to you or you take your work to them and they go, no, don't go, oh my God, yeah. my oh, okay. No, it means that your work was not right for the client. It's the same with galleries. They know who their clients are and they know what their clients are looking for. And if your work doesn't fit what their clients are looking for, they're not going to carry your work. It, it's not a personal right. thing. And, it, and it done, you got to find the market for what you create, for what you are. And the example I'll give you, I paint, I'm a figurative painter. I paint horses and nudes, mostly. And every now and then I'll put a dress on them just to see. <laughs> but, Barnes, but I, 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 I wish I could paint like uh, abstract. I so bad, and um, and I wish I could really do landscape and walls because I could sell them all day long. But that is not me. There's nothing in me in that work. But my work, that my figurative work and my horses, I am all in that work. And so I, I paint to connect with my client. And I do have a lot of designers that are able to say, I know exactly who you need because they know that client wants to connect with that art. So that's another thing of knowing who your market is and what you're doing. I've limited myself by being this, quite honestly. Because I'm never going to be a corporate. Cor corporations don't put my kind of work a lot in there. They don't really want to be kind of that. <laughs> and that's okay. So know these things and make these decisions deliberately as you're kind of honing, you know, we all want to paint everything that we see. That's so pretty. I'm gonna that. You know, hone it in into what works for you. And I will tell you, the universe will tell you what you're supposed to be painting. I wanted to paint children so bad. I wanted to do that because I had a little boy at the time. My figures are the only things that were going out for me. And because that's where I was. So it'll, it'll just listen and it'll come back to you. One of the things I, Lisa and I talked about a while ago was I said, "What's that? They tell you if you're supposed to, that you're supposed to just do just one thing. What are you What are you doing?" And she said, "Oh, well, I have my work. I have this kind of work in this gallery. I have another kind of work in another gallery." And I didn't know that was possible until I talked to her. I thought, "Oh, I can only do one, whatever, and that's it." And it's not true. No, my bra Atlanta is blue, blue and green, blue and green and white, blue and green and white, a little pop of orange, and maybe some navy. I mean, that's uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, 
right, but you go out southwest, it's the south. She's right. You go southwest, and they want those reds, and they want those oh, yellows, yeah, those and those greens, and those southwest. pops of color. And so you can get your color game on by having different markets for what you create. And if you just want to paint in blues, that's great. I love blues and turquoise. I do. My house has none of it. <laughs> but I love the color. I can't give it up. I wish I could, but I do love paint. So, uh, you know, yes, find the market for your different parts of you. There's different parts of you, you know. You might be the floral person over here. Find your market for that. Find your market for your horses here, whatever. Then it may be a different part of the country. And be okay with getting the no. You're all a little thick skin. It's going to happen. Sorry, go ahead. You had a question. Sorry. Just a quick fact one. You mentioned back that um, prints were popular. When you say print, are you talking about woodblock print or reproductive print? Reproductive print. Okay, so that's a big market. Just because they can't afford okay. the well, original. That's very helpful to know. So what, what you'll find is that if, a, if an artist rep comes in, they'll have originals, and then they'll also have a whole other section of just the prints. So Are they signed? But, um, but yeah, so it's like, hey, my budget's this. I'd love to get original art. I'd love to get some wrap canvases in there, whatever it is. Or we're going to do prints. And, you know, I will print on a wrap canvas and make it, obviously. But. We, we just happen to have some photographers in the room. I think this is a good time for photographers to speak about the quality of the prints and, and things like that. And, and you're really helpful in what people are looking for. We, Joel teaches photography. Alan has done several of my prints, and he, I know he's done work on canvas. He can even print on uh, G clays on canvas. So if you guys want to take a second and share some stuff about, you know, what you could, uh, what you know, what artists need to look for to sell their work. Well, yeah, that would be great. I, I, mean, I work with a lot of artists. I, I don't have a famous stable. Um, I tend to work with people who. Are not necessarily beginners in terms of the quality of their work, but are you know, not big popular artists that you might have heard of. Uh, because when I started doing what I was doing, I, I promised myself I would make it reachable for other people who were coming up uh, and trying to sell their work. So that was important to me. But you know, ultimately, when it comes to print work. It's all about the image. I mean, it, the, the print is only going to be as good as the image that the photographer takes. Uh, there's not much you can do with a poor image and make it really great. Um, so, you know, that's an important thing to, to know about who you're working with. Um, I also wanted to ask you a question, in which I would pass along to uh, my artists that I know and, and people here would hopefully want to know that. When you're talking about people interested in prints, is it important that it would be a numbered edition signed print, or is that not such a big deal? I don't deal? think it's quite as big of a deal unless you have someone that is just an, you know, they have a love for art that would know something like that. But the most of the time, for commercial anyway, the clients, they just need art. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah. But that's again for commercial. But that's for commercial. So for for a residential, I'd probably say it might be important. So I, I would change it for residential. Well, it depends on your price point. If you're asking right. for a lot of money, then there can't be that many out there. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You don't want to just start making prints and stuff. You know. I mean, have value to your art too. So I told my dad, I was like, he was going to sell something for a hundred bucks because he didn't. He was like. Hey, he comes from a small town, and so he's like, well, no, I'm like, Dad, $4,500 right now. Yeah. Wow. So, so that's, that's the kind of thing. Like, you have to, just like she was saying, they were talking earlier, you can't get in your head of, like, what you think it's worth or what people may or may not pay for it. Um, people love art, and if they love it, they're going to buy it. You know, and I think the story is huge. Too, you know, you can't just like I will not walk in TJ Maxx home goods or whatever it is. I won't buy a piece of art from there. 
I'm not going to do it. Not even for my friend. I will not send them there. You know, because if 10 other people are going to have the same thing in their house. Those are personal. shows and solo shows when they're trying to build up their reputation you know you can't just keep saying like like Ingrid said you guys are my friend you gotta buy my art you know it doesn't what work that way you can't you can't just keep going to your friends you guys are my friends you have to buy my art it doesn't work that way yeah <laughs> and, and I will say it's smoke and mirrors game any like branding of any product or any business um, I created I had a studio at Tittle Art Center down where Mocha is down on Bennett Street when the galleries were still there before they moved over to Miami Circle. And we had, it was a gallery, and so the front was a gallery, and then I had three studios in the back by myself and two of my friends. And I was the only one that was there, so it was fabulous. They never came, so they paid my rent. But um, we branded that as a gallery. This is before any of us were in a gallery. We branded it as a gallery. We took out ads in magazines as a gallery rep that repped us even though it was us, and that's how I got picked up in Nashville, that's how I got picked up in North Carolina, and it's how I got picked up uh, by two galleries in North Carolina. Because they saw the magazine, and they saw me as if someone else was repping me. And so, I didn't, I've did. i never sent a CD to a gallery, I've never sent an image to a gallery and said, can I please be in your gallery? Never done that. I've always, they found me through a show I'm in, or another gallery, or taking ads out like that, but not as Lisa Moore artist, but at that time it was studio in, it was a gallery. So there's ways to do that, and the reps find you. Reps, I found they don't like to be called. Like oh, Bobby. really? Well, Bobby May, I don't know, Gillis. Yeah. But, um, she used to have a gallery down at Rick Morris and stuff. But um, they are, it's, again, I mean, Find other ways for them to find you. And there's a great um, artbizcoach.com. She's phenomenal. It's online. It's online. Her workshops are great. She does a workshop every November. She's also, she'll come to Atlanta and do a workshop for you. She will come here and do it. Um, okay. But she's, she's phenomenal. She was a museum cur curator, I believe. And she's just very, very good at helping you figure all this stuff out. And she's been a rep, and she's done all that stuff. But she's she's very good, and she has a book you can get. Just read that. She has a blog. Yeah, um, fabulous she blog. That every, and then she teaches classes on find your curator. I was in her acceleration group for for a long time. Okay, so you've had experience with it. Yeah, and I've been to the workshop. Well, that's that happens on the blog prints. Say I I saw the painting. I don't know. And now I have a good image. Painting's gone, and I have to say, what's the happy song? What about if it's just a funny emotion? I know. Sure. You own it. Yeah, I know. I would take the compliment. There's no. That's yours. That is your image. That's your property. But you have to let the buyer know right. that, that you retain those rights. Right. You have to have a contract. Anybody, somebody, anybody, anytime somebody buys your artwork, they you need to let them know up front that this is yours to do whatever you want to do. That they only buy the physical part of it and get to do whatever they want to that physical part without reproducing it at any time. But that's your. So you have to let the customer know, the client, your your collector know up front, and they and they should they will love your artwork enough to, to be okay with that. Say something about that. You know, and what what I did was I registered when I had a lot of images that were from the same series. I registered it with the Library of Congress. You can do it online. Uh, everybody gets confused. So you can do it online because but you you can get it done. So it's actually registered. Um, if you go to court, nobody can afford a copyright battle. It's way too expensive, so forget about that. But 
at least you're legally registered. It doesn't matter if it's painting, whatever kind of visual art it is. But you don't want to do one because it costs $35 or something, and you can have 100 pictures, so 1,000 pictures, whatever. But the other thing I wanted to bring up real quick for prints is that when you're having your work photographed and you're looking for a photographer, first of all, I mean, if you're on the thread shooting it, um, every digital capture, they look good when you look in the back of the camera. But you want to find somebody that knows what they're doing with Photoshop. Because every digital capture needs to be sharpened, and in this case, it's color corrected a little bit. Or if you are giving your file to, there's a couple places in town that make prints, and you don't have that digital file properly uh, made, and your print looks horrible, and they only print what that file tells them to print. You know, so the type of file and the way the file was prepared and possibly the size is resolution exactly, you know, that's important. So if you're looking for somebody, ask them what they're going to do with your file afterwards. How are they going to prepare it? And if they give you a puzzled look, say, it's really nice meeting you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that part's very important is that type of file and just a little some preparation. Um, uh, I thought we went to 9, but we go to 8.30, I was told. So anyway, I've got a few other things with, that I want to do and kind of give a few commercials, you know, because I am in charge of classes and stuff. But uh, I was, also want to introduce you to Joseph. He's in digital art, and he was my student back when I had my art school years ago. So I thought you guys, I thought it would be cool to, to meet someone like that. I can actually help answer some of the questions. Yeah, I'd love to get your contact. Yeah. My, my sure. son is from the bedroom here, and he's done. Yeah, I'm actually a scat grad as well, a uh, scat Nice. Yeah. So I had him back to me when he was 14. Yeah, somewhere yeah. around there. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, it's, it's encouraging, I think, to all of us to see somebody that keeps on going on, yeah. you know. So, and that's another thing you can do to help sell your art is take classes, right? So, and we have several teachers here, and let me say this before I forget, John also does prints for artists, okay? Uh, Alan did do prints, but and, and he still does, but Alan is one of the co-founders of NGAA, and I want to make sure you guys knew that. We have lots of special personalities in this room. I have lots of friends in here, too. I want to point out Karen. Karen also is a professional artist. And she sells her work in Charleston and has done for years and has done really well with it. So it's encouraging. And I think it's cool because sometimes we all, you know, I had, my dad said when I was young, what do you want to do when you grow up? I said, I want to go into art. And he said, whatever you do, don't go into art. So be careful what you tell those young people, okay? Um, we've got Craig here who is visually lacking or whatever. I'm just, you know. Um, yeah, legally blind. Legally blind. Visual art. And he does visual art and he's become a celebrity in his own right. Yes. So, anyway. But, um, I just that? wanted to say something too. Um, Vicki has asked me to start working on the Instagram account. So, and I was talking with um, Anita. Is she Martinez, right here. Yeah. And we were talking about uh, profiling each one of the artists in the, in the membership. So, uh, just so y'all know that we're gonna do that. Well that's a real thing, you see that? It's a real thing, get on it. So we got several sign up things, okay. Number one is the social media workshop. She's gonna do Wednesday, September twenty first. We only have thirty seats available. This is absolutely one hundred percent free. This is what she's volunteering to do. So if you're interested, um, it's Wednesday, September twenty first from ten to twelve. So we're gonna pass this around. If you're interested, let us know. Okay? And then we're also doing a kids work a kids free tryout day. Uh, this got started by uh, Vicky said, "Oh yeah, I'll do that." She said, "I want to do a collage workshop for free for kids." Okay? And so she's going to do this. I said, "Oh my gosh, 
we can have more than one teacher doing this. So Elise has volunteered. She's going to be there too. And um, Margaret, and my brain goes dead. And I know I'm forgetting one other person. Uh, uh, anyway, we're going to have four teachers. Oh, it's uh, Elaine is a friend of mine too. And she taught for me. And she's going to be doing... Um, drawing and painting kind of thing. So it's going to be doing different, we'll be having different centers and they'll rotate around. So if you guys are interested, make sure you sign up. Elise brought in some of, oh, sorry. Some, some, if you want an idea of what she does for the kids, here's some sculpture that she does. She does sculpture and mixed media. There we go. I finally spit it out, didn't I? Okay. So if you're interested, make sure, write your name down, okay? Your kid's name and their age, phone number, all that stuff, okay? We're passing those around. We can only have 20 kids. I mean, I don't know. They're not going to get as much out of it if we have 50. So, um, you guys have, oh, and, and this is, Lee asked me to make sure everybody signs this. If you're a member, make sure and sign this. We forgot to do this. We actually probably should have done this at the beginning. So, do you guys have any other questions? I think we have a few more minutes. Make sure, if anybody's got a really important question or, pre or whatever, feel free to ask. If you've had clients that have paid three thousand dollars for a thirty by thirty and then all of a sudden you're selling them for a thousand. <laughs> no, I just I just had a solo show and nothing sold and so it's even work on Um were you was it were you giving a commission to someone or was it just someone? Um that was be careful because the galleries do not like to be undercut. <coughs> like if they're repping you at a certain price point, they can come to your studio and buy it for less. This happens to me all the time. People will go in a gallery. I'll get a phone call the next day. Oh, I found you online. And da, 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 da. It's like and the more you talk to them, you find out they found you at this gallery. So I still push them back through the gallery for the sale. Yes, they can come to the studio and pick one out. The sale goes to the gallery. The gallery still gets there their piece because they're it's their client. Whereas if they were my client first, they're mine. But I I don't undercut the people who are repping me. But the price may not be the only reason why it's something did not sell. It could be that's the wrong gallery for you. Yeah. It could be they don't have the clientele for that type of art that you're doing. So you have to look at the big picture and know who you are first and find who your customer is and then find the ways to reach them. Yeah. And you are going to sell, like, if a designer comes into my studio, they're going to get a piece of it. So the price will be lower because they'll sell it at retail to their client, but they're like the gallery. They're going to get their commission piece. So do know that. Yep. Absolutely. And if there's a, a rep and a designer and a gallery, everybody gets <laughs> make sure you end up with at least 45% of your retail. <laughs> But you got to really look at those numbers and have that in the contract because the gallery is going to want to give their designer clients their 20%. Well, is that coming off of their 50 or splitting it where each of you ends up with 40? What's the, what's the split? And just have it all written down so it's very clear. And they don't have to call you every week and go, can I get this discount? Please don't call me. Just, you know, you know do that. I like to add one last part because I like to talk. <laughs> uh, I think that this group is very particular and that I know that some of you did not start painting last week, right? You've been painting for quite a long time. Think about how you can share some of that knowledge that you have. I'm looking at the artwork in here. There's some techniques in here that I could not even imagine. Some of you can create some stuff that that is not widely available at schools or places. Social media would be a perfect place for you to do a YouTube video, and uh, and you're Bob Ross for that day, <laughs> right? You're you're in, the, in the Instagram and Twitter works the same way. You post a video on Facebook, you do a Facebook Live. Anybody know what that is? Yeah. All right, there we go. That's right. And uh, you you start the, the the phone, the smartphone, and you start painting and say, hey. Today I'm adding this part and element to my painting and I'm going to show you how I do it. Don't worry that, don't think that tomorrow somebody's going to start doing that technique right off the bat off of watching you one video. Okay, it's not going to happen. Because it took you years to get to that point, right? 
but you share that little tiny bit of yourself, and you start, the next thing you know, you start having an audience be like, what's the next video? And what's the next video? And then your name starts getting around as a person who's a thought leader, a person who's there to share, and a person who has great talent. And the next thing you know, I was like, hey, we need you to, we need 15 of your paintings, here's a bag of cash. And you're like, great. And it all happens because you started to share. So anyway, that's my last thought. Check out artistking.org.